Very good. Thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what we do um, at Ultimate Medical. So my name is Andrew Gardeen. I work for a company, uh, Ultimate Medical. We make the Easy Stand product range. Um, and so we're going to talk uh, tonight about standing therapy, uh, the practical application of standing therapy. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about the products. And if, uh, if you ever have a question or you want to discuss something a little bit more, just put your hand up. Uh, we, can, we can have a bit of a dialogue if, if, you, if you have questions. Just stop me while we're talking because we might not come back around to it um, as we go along. So tonight we're going to focus on uh, pediatrics. Um, Ultimate Medical, uh, we've been doing standing uh, since 1987, so for quite some time. And the, the development of standing as a therapy has is, is, is changed and, and, and improved over the years. And working with pediatrics is something that we had to learn because originally the company was started by a guy who was a C6-7 quadriplegic and we started out in spinal cord rehab um, centers and traumatic brain injury centers. Um, but the adaption of standing to pediatrics is a little bit different uh, than when you're dealing with the adult uh, range. Um, so the first question that uh, I want to talk about a little bit um, is who should be considered for a standing program? And, of course, the answer is relatively simple, but um, actually, the, the, in the way that we apply it, there's all kinds of, of environmental factors that, that affect uh, who, who we allow to get into standing frames and, and who doesn't have access to standing frames. But generally, this is a, this is a who, uh, list of, of some of the things that would be indicated uh, who, would, who would be appropriate to do a standing therapy program with. So basically anybody who doesn't have the ability to stand on their own, um, who's either sitting in a wheelchair or lying in bed, not able to get up and stand on their own, or somebody who has difficulty balancing and keeping the standing posture. Uh, under their own strength and ability. Um, usually it's due to disease, illness, or disability. Now, um, we always recommend that a standing program has to be part of a whole uh, integrated health um, out, uh, system for, for a client. So we get calls a lot of times where patients just, ha they want to stand because they think it'd be a good idea, or they're looking for some pain relief, or they want to do something functional. But we always recommend that it be referred back to the physical therapist or the doctor, because the way that we're going to deal with standing is always from a health benefits first point of view. So that, and that can be a little bit different from different cultures. There's different value systems that, 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 that come up, but especially in the United States, we always have uh, the med we start with the medical side first, and then we go into the social and functional aspects of standing uh, afterwards. And one thing we're going to talk about is some of the health benefits that come from standing. But if we're going to achieve those health benefits, it's very important to understand how you get them, uh, dosing, how much time you spend in the standing position, to think about the practical application of how that's going to play out. And that's all part of a good program set up for continuing a standing practice and then therapeutic follow-up. But basically the question was, who should we consider for standing? And the simple answer is uh, anybody who's using a wheelchair um, as their primary source of mobility or their primary way to be uh, positioned throughout the day. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, we estimate that maybe... Uh, 3% of people that actually are using wheelchairs actually have a way to get up and, and standing. It's a very, very small percentage of people that actually do standing therapy um, and just never do stand up um, overall. So it's, it's an area where there's a, a, a lot of need for improvement. Now, there's some, there's some things that you want to think about and be careful of when you're starting to consider clients for standing. Um, uh, we have this labeled as contraindications, and some of these can be contraindications, but there are also things that you just have to be careful of and think about 
and, and think about how you're going to manage for certain clients. So first of all, orthostatic intolerance uh, syndrome, um, basically dealing with low blood, blood pressure. So anytime that you take the heart and you elevate it and you have to return blood all the way back from your ankles, you, you run the risk of somebody uh, fainting on you. Um, some of those cases can be more severe than, than others, postural, uh, postural tachycardia. Uh, the other thing is impaired skeletal structure. So brittle bones. Now, we don't see this too much uh, on the pediatric side. This would be maybe more uh, adults or the elderly. We deal more with this. But what we do see with, um, with pediatrics is sometimes we don't get real uh, developed hip joints. Sometimes uh, be, if somebody hasn't been bearing weight in the standing posture, we have to think about how changing posture and bearing weight through the hip or through the knee or through the ankle is going to affect that joint. Um, so you just want to think about that. Contractures, um, generally we say if you can't, if you can't get more than 30 percent, um, uh, if you have a contracture greater than 30 percent and non-reducible, meaning that it's a calcified fixed contracture, um, then you're probably not going to get a lot of the advantages uh, that come out of standing. Um, so it might be more risk than reward at that point. Um, and then there's a, there's a lot of things that are common that patients will feel when they start a standing program. So pain, dizziness, sweating, labored breathing, increased spasticity, fatigue, and blood pooling in the lower legs. Um, so this is all things that can happen be, uh, when you start a standing program. Now the, the flip side of that, though, is all of these things are also improved. And the major systems of the body that are affected negatively by standing are also gain strength and are, and are rehabilitated through a standing program as well. So it's a matter of making an evaluation for a patient on if we're going to help them or if this is going to be too severe a case that, that, that causes more harm uh, than it helps. Uh, we, keep, uh, we, we try to keep records or surveys the best we can of what kind of um, disabilities, what kind of conditions um, our clients are using that use our standing um, products. Cerebral palsy in pediatrics is probably our biggest one uh, for sure. So we, we do a lot of cerebral palsy with standing. Uh, Deschain's muscular dystrophies, um, a lot of the different dystrophies. Um, we do some brittle bone disease, osteogenesis imperfecta, spina bifida, hyboxia, and some, some of these are a little bit more rare. Um, but those are, those are some of the conditions that we see uh, with kids on the pediatric side. So here's just a couple of pictures, again, just kind of repeating the last slide of, of conditions that we can use uh, in the standing, um, for, with the standing program. Um, what I want to do now is just review uh, what benefits we get out of a standing program. So um, these, are, these, are, these are well known, but it, it's good to think about um, the different benefits that we have, because what we, what you want what we want to do when we're when we're talking about these is standing positively impacts every major system of the body, but our clients struggle with different parts of these uh, at, at different times. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to uh, run through and review um, the, the medical benefits. So the first one is uh, standing facilitates respiration, reduces upper body upper respiratory infections, and increases oxygen intake by allowing the lungs to expand. So obviously when you're sitting down, uh, a lot of our kids sit in postures where they can't breathe very well, they're, they're, they're closed up, or they're sitting back in, in reclined um, wheelchairs or strollers, and they just don't, they don't have the ability for the lungs to dangle and percuss. So when you stand up, what happens is you're opening up the chest cavity, your diaphragm drops, and you have much more ability to bring in more oxygen, and you can also expel it. So you can, <laughs> you can cough and move the fluid out of your lungs. It's much more productive uh, in terms of um, breathing and, and, and also expelling. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. We don't think about that a lot, but just the ability to get up, to stand up, to breathe, um, to, to have better function of the lungs can be a big benefit. Um, Another one is normalizes bowel function. 
increases gastrointestinal activity and reduces the risk of constipation. So th this is also a very important one for day-to-day -day quality of life issues. So we don't think about it a lot with standing, but if you've done standing practice, um, it's actually pretty typical, especially with somebody who isn't used to standing. You get them into the standing frame, and it's not uncommon for that to trigger the ball right away, and then they might have to go. Um, so if you, if, you, if you have worked with standing for a while, you're probably aware of that. If you haven't done much standing, it's just something to keep in mind um, that, it, that, that it does work pretty well. Um, and just for general digestion, uh, letting gravity, same thing. We're opening up the abdominal area. We're opening it up and, and allowing it to flow. And in fact, um, if we think about the so it impacts our, our kids quite a bit, but I have quite a few friends that are in wheelchairs as adults, and they live their life uh, in, a, in a wheelchair. And one of the things that really causes a lot of problems is if their bowel system gets off and, and, is, and doesn't stay on track, it, it can ruin a day for them. So all of a sudden they've got to go home, or what they're doing is just finished. Um, so being able to count on a regular bowel program helps. So I have a lot of friends who tell me that what they'll do is they'll just get in their state. If they've got something uh, to do during the day, before they leave the house in the morning, they'll get in their standing fr uh, frame. It'll help their bowel system move. And then they know that they can be gone and out of the house for three or four hours. Um, so as a quality of life issue, it's, it just really helps manage the day. And it's, it's something that we don't think about a lot, but it has a very uh, um, a good practical application. To, to everyday life. Uh, standing increases range of motion, helps prevent hip, knee, and ankle uh, contractions. So this is one that we, we, we see a lot, and this is one of the biggest benefits. So we take surveys from time to time of why our standing frames are being prescribed, especially the sit-to-stand standing frames that we'll talk a little bit about with the, with the bantam later. But one of the biggest reasons that we see right now is the prevention of contractures, uh, specifically in the hips, but also in the knees and the ankles. So if you're able just to get full extension in your hips, bear weight through your hips, your knees and your ankle, you're going to be able to prevent hip flexion contractures. But unfortunately, we see lots and lots of kids who just don't get that, and then all of a sudden their contractures get tighter and tighter, and they just they just get pulled out of shape and all of a sudden they can't sit in their wheelchair properly. You know, they get twisted and contorted into positions where their function, it, 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 they just have a much tougher time being, um, being able to, to do things and it's painful. So a simple standing program, a passive sustained stretch, it doesn't even take that much time. If you can just do 20 or 30 minutes a day, it's going to do, it's going to be able to help you completely avoid hip flexion contractures. Um, as well as in the knees and ankles. So this is, I just threw this picture in. So this is the, this is a picture of this girl <laughs> um, uh, being evaluated for, for her easy stand. So this is the first time that she ever got into the easy stand. And we see, and you see there that she, that's as far as she can go because her hips are pretty tight and that's as far as they were going to take her today. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a, it's right about 45 degrees, um, you know, and probably not a great position to spend a lot of time in because she's taking some weight on the knees, right? So she's gonna she can do it for a while, but we wouldn't want to just leave her there for an hour, right? But at least we get the chance on the evaluation to make sure it works. She's you know it's not a traumatic experience. She's comfortable. It's gonna work. So this is just. Um, a few weeks later, or a month or so later, and we see that now we've been able to go from this case where we weren't able to fully extend, but because we got bearing weight every day, all of a sudden we're able to go and get full hip extension. And then once we get this, we're going to be able to maintain it. So she doesn't have to stay in this position all the time. She can change up and down and back and forth. But um, we see this all, all the time uh, when we're dealing with kids, just being able to work out the hip contractures. The other one is the heel cords that get really tight. So a lot of times we got kids and they're just, they're like that. And, and sometimes we have to put the toes down, but then just passive sustained stretch, we can really stretch out the heel cords as well. 
And it's easy because we're just using the body's weight. We're just using gravity to do the stretching. We don't have to hold the stretch. Um, we just let the we just let uh, gravity do it for us. Um, another benefit is maximizing weight bearing on the long bones of the legs. So specifically, we're thinking about the um, the femur, uh, the tibia, fibia as well. Um, it prevents or stabilizes osteoporosis and hypercalcemia cysts in skeletal development. Out of all the benefits of standing that we're going to talk about, this one probably has the most amount of research. So all of these benefits that I'm giving you comes right out of research studies that have been done all over the world, in the, in the U.S., Europe, um, all over the place. Bone density is by far the most researched topic. And so what you're going to find with this, so the real question is, how much time do I have to stay in the standing position to actually see a benefit or to see some effect? It's also, out of all the ones that we're going to talk about, the one that probably takes the most amount of time. So for me to, <coughs> for me to positively increase the, the, the calcium or the mineral deposits or the strength of my bones and to remold it, uh, um, there's studies that say that you can see benefit with half hour a day. There's studies that see, say that you can see benefit with two hours a day. There's some studies that say you need to stand six hours a day. There's also studies that say there's no benefit uh, standing one hour a day or no benefit seen 45 minutes. So what, what, what's important to understand about this issue is there's studies on both sides. Um, as we've read through the different studies, when you look at the best studies done on this subject, there probably is some benefit that you can re regrow uh, the bone and help it get stronger, but you're probably looking at least two hours and probably more like four to six hours a day. So on the practical side, now, it's, now with children, it's going to be a little better. Most of those studies are looking at adults. They're not looking at kids when the bones are actually developing. Um, but as a, but as adults, it's probably that's just a lot of time to get in the standing position. And if you think about practically carrying that out, that's where you want to think a little bit about if you're going to prescribe it for that, are you actually going to be able to carry out that therapy program to see all the way through to the results? Probably it's going to be difficult. Um, but there is there's other studies that do show that there is stimulation or impact in helping the lower lumbar um, in the spine develop. And especially when we think about acetabular development in children, so the way your hip joint forms, and we're going to talk about abduction a little bit later on, there definitely is bone molding and development of joints um, that, that there are good studies for and, and where, where, where benefit can clearly be seen. Now, one thing that all the studies do find, um, and this, is, this also probably has a little bit more to do with adults, is that once you have a traumatic accident, you're going to lose most of the bone density um, within the first eight, six to eight weeks is when the most loss happens. And then after that, it slows down and stabilizes. So if you can get somebody into a standing program, it'll help maintain the density that they already have. It'll slow down the loss. And they can maintain that with just kind of a steady standing program. Um, so we see a lot of our spinal cord traumatic brain injured centers in the U.S. They actually get people as soon as they're stabilized from an accident, they get them into standing within the first week, and, and they're doing standing therapy right away for that reason. Um, standing increases circulation, obviously uh, reduces orthostatic hypotension, and um, it builds cardiovascular endurance. So like I said at the beginning, when you elevate your heart, your whole circulatory system has to work harder to return blood all the way down and all the way up again. And you'll see that our patients, when, when they go into the standing position, they're going to feel like they're exercising. I mean, you can see them sweat. You can see them kind of breathing heavy because the body's really working to get that circulatory system going again. And if you have patients that do get a little bit of swelling, um, we don't see it a lot with, with kids, but the older patients get or the taller they are, that you know you might start to see some swelling in the ankles. But the, the, the nice thing about the cardiovascular system is it'll strengthen It'll pump that blood, and, and, it'll, and, the, and it'll improve over time. You just have to go at a pace that, the, that they're able to tolerate. 
improves urinary drainage, prevents or reduces urinary tract infections. There's a lot of research about this as well, and standing is actually um, quite effective in, in helping reduce uh, urinary tract infections. So what happens is when you're sitting, and this, this one doesn't take any time at all. It's merely about the change of position. When you're sitting, your urinary tract is bowed, and when you stand up, you get pressure on it, and it helps evacuate the stagnant urine. And all it is is it's just a change of position. And actually, you can kind of physiologically feel this as well. If you, if, we, if you just sit for a long time, and then all of a sudden you stand up, you feel like you got to go, because physiologically there's been a change in your posture that instigates that movement. Well, if you're just sitting in your wheelchair all day, that never happens. So you get stagnant urine that never moves through the urinary tract, and that increases that risk of infection. And so <coughs> if you have clients that just struggle with urinary uh, infections, UTIs, over and over, and they're on antibiotics three, four, five months of the year, um, standing can be a, a good remedy for that. Just And it's just a change of position, just up for five minutes, two or three, four or five minutes, and down again, and that evacuates the urine and, and helps keep it um, keep it moving. So, And that can that can be a big quality of life issue as well, because if somebody, maybe you don't reduce 100% of the urinary tract infections, but let's say if you got somebody who goes from maybe six a year, and, and just by standing, they can go down to two or three a year, you've all of a sudden reduced the amount of antibiotics, you've reduced the amount of time days that they're sick, and, and, it, and it improves the quality of life um, pretty well. So then, of course, this one uh, reduces the risk of pressure sores, minimizes skin breakdown through changing positions. So obviously, we're taking all of the pressure that we're sitting on all the time, and we're just standing it up, and we're, just re we're redistributing the pressure through, the, through our knees and onto our feet. In standing, but the other thing that we're doing is we're bringing in more oxygen, and we've got better circulation. So the reason that we get skin breakdown is lack lack of oxygen to the cells, right? So the oxygen doesn't get distributed through the blood to the cells, and it and, and the skin dies. That's what a pressure sore is. So when all of a sudden you're breathing in more oxygen and you have better circulation, you're actually helping a decubitus area heal much faster, um, besides the fact that you're taking pressure off. So, it, so it, can be a, it can be a really good part of a remedy for, for people who, who've got pressure sores um, or skin ulcers. Another big one uh, um, is decreasing abnormal muscle tone or trying to deal uh, with spasticity. So for clients that, that have a high amount of tone or a lot of spasticity, again, it's just a passive sustained stretch. And we have some kids who this completely changes the way that they go through their day. So it'll reduce the amount of medication that they have to be on. But if they try to go to school and their tone just pulls them way out of alignment or they have a lot of spasticity, they can't even write. There's a lot of kids who will come into the standing frames They'll stand for half an hour, 45 minutes, then that'll guarantee that they can sit peacefully um, for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Then they have to change positions and stand again because they're going to start to, their tone's going to come back in and they're going to start to get out of position. But if they can go to standing, stretch out, and then they can have productive times in their sitting position again. And then they, can, they have to go back and come back. So they get through their day by half hour periods of just standing and stretching out and it help, it really helps them combat um, spasticity. Um, and then uh, <coughs> finally there's a big positive psychological impact uh, to standing. So um, every in the in the US whenever we provide a standing frame our, our state our federal system and our state systems have funds for people to get standing equipment. But unfortunately, they don't really consider this a medical benefit. Um, so that can, that can also be a little bit different based on societies. If you go to Australia, the social impact and the integration of how you're relating to people around you is the primary concern. Uh, the, 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 some of the medical benefits are, are secondary in their funding system. They're more interested in having the disabled people be functional, integral parts of society again. So it can be a little bit different on how societies value the importance of standing. But what doesn't change is when you see somebody be able to stand up 
that hasn't stood up for a long time. It's, it's just part of the human experience. So when you don't have the ability to stand up, um, and even, you know, I'm communicating today, so I'm talking. I do that from the standing position. Um, or kids in school. Uh, be, you know, you ask a kid who has a standing frame, what do they like about their standing frame? It makes them feel better. They can do things. What they like is when all the kids go down to lunch, they can also stand up and go down to lunch. You know, it's the social aspect that a lot of times are the most important, both for the child and, and, and for the family as well, or, or, the, or the, the people that are living with them, teachers, things like that. So all of these benefits that we, that we just went over, I kind of brushed over them uh, quickly, but this all comes out of uh, research studies. And we do have, I've got these links up here, and I can give them to you later, but we've got these, we've, what we've done is we've gone through all the different studies that have been done on standing, and we've tried to organize them on our website so that if you, need, if you want to, if you, have to, if you ever want to look up or read them, or if you have to write a letter of justification and you want to cite some sources, you can go to our website and you can type in like cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy, and the studies that looked at those client groups will come up and we've kind of organized them so that the best ones kind of come up first or you can look at it by condition so if you want to look at well what what's what are the studies that looked at facilitating respiration and what did they find and what did they say you can type in respiration and it'll come up by medical benefit and it'll show you the studies that, that speak to that effect so that's at this link here uh, then we also have some case studies and we have some tools for writing uh, letters of medical necessity and tying it back to the medical benefits. Natural part of your life, and if it can have some functional benefits as well, so it helps you get a job done or it helps you be more productive at school, that means that you're not just doing it for the medical benefit, but you're doing it because it makes sense in, in your day-to-day -day activities. And if you do that, you're going to get the benefit out of it every day. And that's where you really start to see a, a huge impact on the posture of these kids. So you, you, can, you can see we've got some school districts uh, like in Los Angeles, um, there's different sections of the city that, and each section decides how they're going to pay for equipment or how they're going to provide services to kids with disabilities. And so some of these districts are real aggressive and, and they provide really good seating systems, they provide a lot of therapy hours, they make sure the kids have the equipment at school. And so these kids go from four or five years old all the way till they're 18 with their posture really well managed in standing programs. And then you'll have a district that's just 10 miles away without such an emphasis on, on that kind of thing. And then you see these kids when they get to be 15 or 16 years old and you can look at them in their wheelchair and you can tell which school they went to because one kid has contractures and their, and their postures, you know, their spine's all contorted and the, their posture just hasn't been managed very well. And, and you can tell that they didn't, get the, they didn't get the equipment or the therapy, and, and it completely changes what they're able to do into their late teens, early 20s, and then they have to start over with it. You know, some of that can be undone, but some of the effects of that just completely um, change what somebody's able to do. So one thing that we want to do when we're... When we think about the medical outcomes of what we're trying to accomplish with, with the kids, you want to think it all the way through. You know, so if somebody is dealing with spasticity or tones, we want to think about, okay, I need probably 35 minutes to 40 minutes is what the research says. Or I've put the kid in and I know that if they just stand for 20 minutes, they're going to be okay for an hour and a half. So then you think about, okay, where are they going to do that? They're going to, they're going to come in here and do it in the institution or they're going to do it at school and then we carry it out. So we want to, th we want to think about all of these things, when we think about carrying out this uh, standing program, we have to think about where is it going to happen? Is the room big enough or is the room too crowded? Is there too much going on in that room for that kid to want to stay in the standing frame or is there an environment where they have some time to be able to get in for enough time? Do we have the staff to move them to do the transfer, to get them in, to get them out safely, or is mom or dad there? Is there family involvement? You know, what are the structure of the days? Is there enough time to do it appropriately at a certain time of day, or should it be better done later in the afternoon or the evening? So we think about all these things, and that should all, 
all of the answers, not all the answers, but a lot of the answers to some of these questions, your equipment should be able to help you do that. You have to think about how it's going to be carried out day after day and as, as the client grows. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we start talking about the equipment. But you always want, you always want, when you're, when you're considering somebody for a standing, you want to think about where they're going to end up in two months or six months or two or three years from now, what that ideal goal is, and write the program out and think about how the equipment's going to accomplish that. So we have choices with, on, on how to do standing. Um, so long leg braces. Um, so th these are adult braces, but we used to use those a lot in the U.S., going back maybe 30 years, 40 years. And so everybody would get prescribed a, a set of braces. And the unfortunate part of this is a lot of times they would use them one or two times, and then they wouldn't use them again, and it was expensive. Um, but I have, I have friends who still use these, and they use them to get in and out of their car. Um, it makes it easier to transfer out of their wheelchair. Um, so there's still practical application for this. We don't see them that much anymore, but they're still around. Um, I still see boxes like this in the rehab, in rehab centers, and they're still used. And we used to have a program in the U.S. where you would get... Um, you would get a set of instructions to go to the, the lumber store and build yourself a standing frame when you got home and out of rehab. Now, something like this, it's possible to stand, but when we think about compliance, it's not, it doesn't take very much for somebody not to be able to use this anymore. You're going to need some assistance. It's going to be somebody who has to have an incredible amount of balance and strength to be able to use something like that. Um, so it's very limiting in, 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 in what we're going to be able to accomplish. It has its purpose, but it's going to be limited. Then we've got the, the tilt tables. And tilt tables came out of um, where we really started seeing these is after, um, like in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, soldiers started surviving the wars, and they were in these hospital wards, and they just laid in bed for months and months and months. And their cardiovascular systems, they couldn't get out of bed. So that's actually where the tilt table came into being. It was basically to rehabilitate the cardiovascular system to get soldiers to be able to get up and start walking again after, after war injuries. Um, and, and we still use it today. Um, it's, a good, it's a good solution, and it's a, it's a supine um, position. But you don't get a lot of, you're not going to do anything about managing a knee contracture or... <laughs> Hip flexion, we, you know, we've, we've started, we've, it, for our pediatric things that we have to think about with all the kids that we see, it probably doesn't do a whole lot. But it, it was good, it's good for the, the purpose it has. What we're going to talk a little bit about as well is supine standing, the different positions that we can stand in. So we have supine standing, prone standing, upright standing, and we have sit to stand. Um, we also have some very advanced um, standing wheelchairs. So um, standing wheelchairs are getting much better um, as, as, we go, as, we, as we go further and further ahead. So we have much better postures with standing wheelchairs. Um, but it's important to know what to look for when you're getting a standing wheelchair. You have to, again, back to the previous slide, you have to know what your outcomes are. What are you trying to do with the standing program? So if you're trying to prevent uh, hip flexion contractures, you need full extension of the hips. A lot of standing wheelchairs don't go to full standing. They only go to here. So you're not going to get great full extension. And then if you don't get that, you might not get your, your balance. But what they are really good for is if, you want, if somebody wants to go back to work or they want to reach a shelf and move around and be productive in an environment, it's a great tool for, for something like that. Um, then we have sit-to-stand standards, which the, which the easy stand is, uh, where you can change positions. So you're going from sitting to standing. And that's something that we really believe in. If you're going to be able to carry out a standing program, you really have to be able to be, be comfortable and productive, and you have to be able to change positions and, and do it relatively easily. So what we're going to jump into a little bit is the, is the Easy Stand, the pediatric product range that we have for Easy Stand. So we do cover kids all the way from early intervention, so kids nine months old, um, all the way through uh, full adulthood. So we have a number of, of ranges of sizes of, of, of products, and they work a little bit differently based on the size. And we also have different positioning. So prone, 
sit to stand um, upright standers. So one thing that I want to just kind of talk about before we get started, I just this is all the different size ranges that we have in products. So right here is kind of the line. Everything above here is, is more or less a pediatric product, and everything down here is more or less an adult product, um, up to about 168 centimeters, 90 kilos. This, these can even be adult products as well, so it's not a, it's not a clean line. But what we do want to do with all of our products is we want, if a, if a kid starts using a product at the early end of the range, we want them to at least get five or six years use out of that product. So everything that we make is adjustable so that it can grow with a, a child and they, and they can stay in their standing program. Um, and then we have, we've started to adapt different systems. But you, and you'll also see that a lot of these overlap. But that's because we don't always get to see them right at this point or right at that point. They might come in halfway through it. And so then you have to make a determination. You know, are they, well, they might just be right at the end of this one. Well, let's get them into the next size up. Or, so there's always determinations about sizing. Um, but we do, have a, we do have an overlapping range that we, that we can accommodate that with. Um, the other thing I want to talk a little bit about as well is the standing positions. So um, when you looked at all that standing, the slide that before I showed supine standers, upright standers, prone standers, um, and sit to stand standers. Now, if you or I stand up, we stand pretty well balanced, um, and the the ideal posture, the posture that, that our bodies are developed to stand in, our head is balanced over our shoulders, and everything's in a nice line. So my head's over my shoulders, over my hips, over my knees, and over my ankles, right in a nice line. And that's ideally what we'd like to accomplish with our clients. Why? Because we're bearing all of our weight, we're structurally sound, and we actually give the head a good base to balance on. So I don't have to work real hard to balance my head, because my head's right over here. Now, as soon as I go prone, or as soon as I sit in a, in a, if I sit in a reclined wheelchair, now my head is behind my shoulders, and it's going to want to go that way. Now I'm holding it up, but I'm not develop, I'm not using any muscles to hold my head up. And then if I want to look down at my paper here, I've got to pull my head forward like this to look down. So we sit our kids a lot of times in reclined wheelchairs and we do that because it's helpful because we're using gravity to control the trunk so there's valid reasons for doing that but some of the but what happens is the kids a lot of times they end up pulling their head forward and they don't naturally learn to to balance their head over their shoulders so my opinion is and as I've stood a lot of kids this the, the objective that I'm always looking for is tr is try to get them lined up so that they have a chance to start to learn how their, head, how their head balances and get their vestibular system to kick in so that they get a chance to learn to balance their head. Now what happens is a lot of times their muscles on the back of their neck are real long because they're, they, they pull their head forward over their hips to look around anyway. So when they get up to standing, they'll stand nicely for a few minutes, but then all of a sudden the head's over the tray because they just can't tolerate the position very well. So that's one thing that is nice about the supine position is we can take the upright position, we can go into a supine and we can use gravity to support the head, support the trunk, and just like that tilt table that we saw, we're giving full support through the anterior part of the body. And what, it, what that does is it also allows us to get people into anywhere from, from 90 degrees flat supine all the way to vertical, but we can go right to a point that they can tolerate, we can find the balance point, but we can still get full extension of the hips, full extension of the knees. So the supine position is, is helpful and appropriate for dealing with clients that, that need structure or need some support to get to standing. Then we have the prone position. And so the prone's a little bit different. We're taking, the, we're taking all the support on the anterior side part of the body. And there's a couple of reasons why uh, prone standards are, are prescribed. Now, most of the time, you're going to see prone standards with younger kids. <coughs> And one of the reasons that it's done is to get the kids, it's a part of the developmental stage where the kids start arcing their back, they have to pick their head up and get them to raise their eyes up and do the, and do the arching of the back. Um, 
as well. But it's also to instigate, to try to get them to start to learn head control a little bit. So if we put them in prone, we can do that. Prone can also be used um, sometimes in combination with seating systems. But sometimes if you want a kid to start working on an activity, if they don't have control of their head or they can't get their eyes focused on the table, sometimes if we can get their eyes down and looking, now they can be functional with their hands and they can be integrated in the, in the activities that they're trying to do on the tray. One of the problems with prone, though, is it's a, it's a fatiguing position. So where supine gives you a lot of support, prone takes a lot of it away for head control. So you, you have to work to keep your head up. And eventually you're going to tire out. And so you're not going to, you can't tolerate the prone position for long periods of time. Eventually it's, you just fatigue out of the position. Oh, the other, the other thing, the other reason that I've seen prone used as well is sometimes when we're trying to get full extension or get extra extension the hips, now if we stand in prone, we can also use gravity to our advantage. So we can put a strap here and we can pull down and we can get better extension um, through, the, through the hips. Um, and then uh, what we also have is, is sit to stand. So where we go from sitting up to standing, uh, the full upright position. So that's, that's going to be a vertical, um, but it's also what that does is, um, well, there's some benefits to sit to stand, which, I'll, which I'll, I'll talk about here. So here's some of the, here's, here's what we get out of a, a sit to stand standard. So the first thing is, Anybody who's in a wheelchair gets into their wheelchair at the beginning of the day and gets out of their wheelchair at the end of the day. So they have some way to get in and out of the wheelchair. And, and, and it's a, it's, it's a, the, a sit to stand stand or like the easy stand, um, it's a lateral transfer into it. So now this one's just a little bit small for me. So I can flip this, I can pull this knee pad off or I could flip it out of the way on this bantam medium. I should be able to flip it out of the way. There we go. Anyway, if I was gonna if I was gonna transfer independently, I'm just gonna take this. Let's pretend this is my wheelchair. Now I do have to go up a little bit here, but one of the skills that we're trying to teach kids or anybody in a wheelchair is if they can do a transfer, we're trying to teach them independent transfers. So now this is not a very similar height system I'm going to have to go up a little bit but if I can if I can do this kind of thing to get across here that's really helpful where if I have to climb into a prone stander or up into the standing position and secure myself that's a completely different that requires a whole different skill set than just coming across so this this transition to a similar seating height means that it gives a chance a lot of my clients already have those skills because they they know how to get into their wheelchair and out of their wheelchair if they have that capability. Some of them don't, but a lot of them do. So we're, we're naturally giving them the abilities that they've already learned a little bit, and they can use some of those skills to get across and get into it. Um, now the next thing is, and this is gonna, this standard is a little bit too small for me, so I'm, <laughs> I should be in the, in the adult one back there. But um, let me just close this back up. So once I get in here, now the next the next thing is, it's a very gentle, natural transition to standing. So you see how slow that I'm going up. So now I'm, I'm bearing weight, and I don't have this set up properly, but I can stop at any point in time. So, and I, and I recommend that. It takes a lot of the anxiety out of it for kids. So if we can take them up just a little bit, if we put them right up to standing, that's quite abrupt. So now they're breathing and their cardiovascular system is going to be working a little bit. If we can just go and let somebody acclimate, especially to the cardiovascular or you know to the blood pressure change, and you give them a few minutes just to balance, 
see how their balance changes when they go up. Um, I have the tray over there, but especially if I have the tray on here, it makes it a very stable, you feel very safe in it. Um, and so it's a, it's a, and it's a natural, gentle transition. So the other thing is my eyes are looking around the room naturally. Um, it's a little bit different than if I was in supine position. I'd be looking at, this, at the ceiling and the horizon comes into view for me. And if you've ever been in a supine stander, it feels very unnatural. You feel like you're going to fall out of it forward. But when your head's already looking forward, you're participating in the change of movement because you're seeing how things change around you and, and you feel balanced. So it makes it much more natural and gentle. And the other thing is we can, of course, stop at any point in time. So, you know, some kids we might start to see some spasticity and we might trigger that. So all we have to do is just go back down to the point where we're not triggering it. And then we can just go to the point where we're just slowly stretching out and we can take it at a pace that they can tolerate. So that's, that's a huge advantage because what it lets you do is deal with each client individually right where they're at that day. And the thing is the kids change. So if you see a kid every day and then all of a sudden they don't come for two or three weeks and they haven't gotten their therapy, they're not stretched out, they haven't done their standing, well, they might be in a completely different situation than where you left them two or three weeks ago. So you might have to start over with stretching. So they might have been able to get vertical and have a really good position, but maybe you haven't seen them for a month or two. Well, now we just start over where they're at. So it's a very dynamic way of bringing the kids how they feel that day. I mean, some days they're sick, some days they're just tighter than others. You know, how they feel and what they can do can change uh, quite a bit. So now, like I said before, um, the final position, and this isn't probably going to fit me very well, but we always want to get to the full upright position. And I don't have, I need to have a, <laughs> a strap on, a belt on here. I don't have one on. But I want to get all the way up where I can get full extension in my hips if I can. So, and if I can do that, that's great. Um, and they might not be able to tolerate that real well. So the other nice thing about sit to stand is when I get fatigued, I can just come back down a little bit as well. So, so th 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 those are some of the benefits of of the sit to stand um, positioning, as opposed to you know going prone standing to vertical or supine standing to vertical. So we talked about how this how this can make a big difference in the environments that we're working in. So if we think about applying a sit-to-stand standard or the ability to do something like this to the home environment, so we have just a couple of pictures here. Now this isn't standing therapy at all. He's just sitting at the table eating, but in that sit-to-stand, he's up a little bit. He's got some anterior tilt in his, in his hips but he's, he's using it to, you know, to eat around the table. So he can go from there, he can be up a little bit, or he can get up to a surface and be functional at a, at a counter. So you can complete tasks. It also lets you stand according to what your schedule is. So we have a lot of kids um, who will come home uh, after school, maybe two or three o'clock, and they'll get into their standing frame from the time they're home till maybe dinner time. And they can change positions quite a bit. They can do their homework, and then maybe they'll get back in their wheelchair after dinner or, so, or some. It, it's just a good way for mom to manage two or three hours of time, be able to change positions. It also keeps, it keeps the kids comfortable because that change of position, it's quite fatiguing just to sit in the same fixed position all day long. It, it just gets tiring. And the kids, by the end of the day, they're worn out. Um, so changing position helps, helps do that. You can stand to relax at home, the interaction, and stand for relief. So a lot of times, even just being able to stretch out your back, do some of this. You don't get to do that in a wheelchair very easily. So then we have um, standing in a home or a school environment. Um, I have a video later of a little girl as she goes through her school day. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get a chance to watch that. But this, this kid here, he's had a standing frame ever since he was a, a little guy. Um, and, he, and now he's finished school, so he's, he's not in school anymore. But you see it's a, it's a classroom desk. But then he all of a sudden gets to stand up. Now he can see. He has better visual 
um, you can look around the room and see. Communicating. So speech therapy. Uh, breathing in more oxygen, passing more oxygen over your vocal cords, announce, enunciating. Um, there's a lot of uh, practical applications for this in the, in the educational environment. Um, it also improves seating postures, like we talked about, just being able to stretch out the hamstrings. Even when, they, uh, when a kid goes back into their wheelchair, they're, they're more comfortable and they can be more productive to write or to work with their communication device if, if they've stretched out. It also refreshes the, the mind. So you're standing up, you're getting more oxygen. That goes to your brain. You're able to concentrate for longer periods of time. You're able to do more complex tasks um, because you're not so fatigued and you're taking more oxygen in. So it helps, you con it helps your concentration. And then, of course, there's benefits to working with sit-to-stand uh, in the institution. So like we talked about, you stand at your own pace. Wherever you're at that day, we can just go to that point, and we can push you just a few degrees more. You know, But, but if, as a therapist, it gives you a really nice tool to always be challenging the patient every day or maybe giving them a chance to just come back or, or relax a little bit. Um, of course, we, we always want to have the health benefits in mind. Um, one, one benefit of sit-to-stand, too, or the easy stands in general, is that, that you can adjust the size of them. So you can, you can fit, use one standard to fit many people. Um, and here I've written easy transfer and easy adjustments. Well, transfers, <laughs> uh, we try to make them easy. They're not always easy. But we'll talk a little bit about strategies for transferring. But the, the real question is possi the possibility of actually getting in and out of the equipment. Because... For some equipment, it's just not possible for people to get in and out. So we try to make them as easy as possible. Another application that we see a lot more is if we have kids that are going to do a gait therapy program or if they're going to do some occupational therapy, if they can get into the standing frame 20 or 30 minutes before they start the gait program, it's going to be a much more effective therapy session because they're already going to be stretched out. So if, they, if you just bring them right out of their wheelchair and then you try to start working on gait for a kid with CP, it's going to be, they're going to come out of that cold and they're going to be tight. But if we can stand them up and stretch them and, and now they're doing some stretches and moving around, now when we actually try to start getting them to, you know, heel, toe and do the gait patterns, it's going to be much more functional if they've been breathing, if their heart's been going a little bit, if they've been stretched out. Um, and it's not just gait therapy, but it's any kind of activity that, that where you're trying to do some, some functional motor skills uh, with, with the kids as well. So what I want to do now is just review some of the different products that we have. So the sit-to-stand um, product that we have uh, for the pediatric kids is called the, the Bantam. Um, and the Bantam basically comes, we have three sizes of Bantam. So we go down, like I said before, to nine-month-old kids to about maybe five or six years old. And then we have the Bantam Small which takes kids from about 5 or 6 years old to maybe 11 or 12. It just depends on the rate of development, but up to 137 centimeters, 45 kg. And then we have this one here, which is a bantam medium, which is basically for, for adolescent kids. So 122 to 168 and up to 90 kg. Um, so we have a range, and they all kind of work similarly. Um, so in a very basic configuration, this is what you're going to get in a bantam standing frame. Now, as we're going through this, if you picked up a brochure on the back, this is the bantam catalog. So it's going to have all three of these in here on this on this purple one. Um, but basically, with any sit to stand, what we do is we have the feet the feet in, we block the knees, and we give some sort of chest support to go from sitting to standing. So that's the bantam small and extra small is built on this frame. And then the bantam medium, which you can see the bantam medium here, is built on this frame. Now this one's a little awkward because we don't have a back on it and we don't have a tray. We used to sell it in a very basic situation like that, but we don't do that anymore. Now when you get a bantam medium, you're probably going to have a minimum configuration of something that looks like that or something that looks like this with a few more options on it. So similar to what we have here today. Um, Now, 
with the Bantam, one thing that we have, you can get this and just sit to stand. So if you just have a sit to stand stander, you can go from sitting all the way up through standing like you see here. But you also have the option to include a supine position as well. So once you include supine, you can go all the way to a full laying down position, or you can do supine standing like this. So I can get full extension, and then I can go uh, into supine position and back out of supine position. Or I can go into an, uh, an intermediate position like this. So imagine now if you have a child that has hip contractures and they can't get full extension in their hips. What I can do is I can match this, I can match the equipment up to the angle that they're able to tolerate, and I can bring them right from that position up to standing and slowly bear weight through the knees and ankles. So I can take a kid that probably really would have no way to get into a, even a supine standard because, because of the way that their knees are bent or hips are bent, and I can slowly start to change and bear weight with that child, with the, with the expectation or hope that, that we're going to stretch them out and they're going to be able to get into a better and better position as we go along. But when you're able to integrate all of these different positions together, I mean, it really goes a long ways towards providing comfort and rest, stretching out. You can teach balance. So even a position like this, I could even put a little bit of anterior tilt in. And in the upright position, I can learn balance. But even if I'm not able to go all the way upright, I can start to learn torso and trunk control. I can move the tray out of the way and I can start to have to balance my trunk and body a little bit. We, of course, learn head control like we, we talked about before, support a tired head and supine standing, and, and all kinds of uh, functional activities. I'm going to go through this a little bit uh, with the one that we have here. But here again with the Bantam medium, you just see some different positions that we're able to get in. So here she's standing a little bit supine. Now this is interesting. We're not going to go all the way supine with this one because well, she, actually, she does have a head support, but you see here the head support's not on here. <laughs> so there it would only be for sit-to-stand. If you're going to go supine, you always need to have your head support on the, on the equipment. Um, but there we see the, the girl in the supine position in the bantam medium. And, and this is all uh, controlled through, through this controller here. I'll, I'll go through that in a, in a second here. Um, we have, when you look through that catalog, there's a lot of, every easy stand has quite a few different ways that you can set it up. The idea is that you're, you have the ability to set up for each situation or each client individually if you want to. So we have some choice of different trays. We have some choice of different positioning systems. So you see the tray, the tray here that I have, um, I can pull that one off. It's a nice big tray. We also have a tray that you can get on this or the other bantams that just swings out of the way. So if I just loosen this up, I can flip this out of the way. I can come in and out. So I can get this style tray on this machine as well or on the other bantams as well. Or I can just get one that, that pulls in or out. It just depends on the environment, where I'm going to be using it, who's going to be helping do the transfer. Certain types of trays might be more or less helpful in different situations. So. But the shadow tray, the tray that goes with you from sitting to standing, is a big benefit because if I can keep that tray on and change positions all the time, all of a sudden if I'm working in school, and you'll see this when you put kids in, you can change positions and they won't even notice. Or even better yet, a lot of times they can just keep themselves comfortable. So they'll get tired of sitting, they just push the button or they push the handle and they can change positions. And all of a sudden, instead of only standing for 20 minutes and being too tired, now just a simple change of position means that they can be in the standing frame for two or three hours. They can't be in the same position for two or three hours, but they can constantly be changing positions. So, and if you think about it, even as we're like sitting here, you know, two hours is too long for us. Just sit and listen. You have to change positions. You have to shift your weight all the time. Well, a lot of times the kids can't do that real easily. So with all of a sudden the ability to just change positions and change dynamic forces on the knees or the seat, it really makes them comfortable for, for long periods of time if they're able to do that. Um, we have some different choices in the types of supports that we can get. So we have contoured backs. So you'll see this system here has a contoured back. I could also just get a flat back. And if I need lateral supports, I could get, I could get supports like this 
up here. So this is a planer system down here. You see it's a flat seat and then I can adjust the um, I can adjust the hip supports in or out. Um, so I could take this type of support and put it up here as well. This is going to handle more weight. So for a kid that really leans a lot, you know, I can block the hip and block the, it's going to give more support. This is a little more general. So this is for the kid that maybe just needs to feel a little bit and then they'll correct their balance or they just need a little bit of support to keep in the upright position. Or the kid that I actually want to start to learn to balance themselves, you know, I can, I can make this a little bit looser and now they have to learn to control their, their balance a little bit. So we have different, we can, we have different supports that go a, across the line. Um, then the knees and the feet are very important as well. So we have a couple different types of supports, ways of dealing with the foot support and the, and the knee support. Um, I'll, I'll talk about those in a sec. I just want to finish going through this. And then we have lift options, so power up. So the one we have here today has a power on it. We also have a hydraulic pump where you push a pump handle and it brings you to sitting and standing. With these two, the child can change positions by themselves. Um, with the first option is a gas spring. That's always done by the therapist or the parent. The, the child can't really change positions by themselves with the gas spring. The nice thing about the gas spring, though, is it's, very, it's the fastest one to change. So if I want to change positions quickly, especially with smaller children, maybe five years old, six years old, it's a nice one to work with. But once the kids get a little bit heavier, sometimes then we move to hydraulic or the power. And they also have the ability to change their, their position. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is just go through, while we're talking about the Bantam, I'm just going to go through uh, a little bit of how we would how we would fit this for somebody how we would set somebody up in the in the bantam so the first thing that we want to do when we're going sit to stand there's two places on your body when you go sitting to standing that move one your knee pivots and the second one your hip pivots okay so there's two places that are pivoting when you're going sitting to standing so on the easy stands we basically have two pivot points we have a hip pivot point which is more or less uh, right here, and then we have the knee pivot point, which is more or less right here. So what we want to do when we set somebody up into the standing, into the standing frame, we want to make sure that we adjust the back to the appropriate um, depth. So right now I open this one all the way up to the full uh, back extension, just so I could get up when I when I was when I was showing you before. Um, but what we want to do is we want to make sure that the knee is this, the place where my knee pivots. I want that to be as close to this as possible. So what that means, um, um, actually, maybe could I have a volunteer? Yeah, you can. I'll, I'll fit you. Yep. So now these will these will flip out of the way. If we just push this, this one's a little bit jammed, but there, there we go. So we, fl we flip these out of the way. So now before, <coughs> now if I was going to put a client in here for the first time, actually what I would do is I would probably get a measuring tape while they're in their wheelchair, and I would take a measurement with my measuring tape from the back of the leg here to the back of the back there. And then I would match it up to the seat to see. But I can see right here that I need to close this down two or three inches because she's sitting sacral. But actually, if I look here, I have two or three inches there. So what I, what I actually want to get you to do is pick yourself up and, and move yourself back. Because what I want, remember, I want the knee as close as possible to this point here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this up, and I can adjust the width of this a little bit. Now, here's what happens. Now, sometimes we, we get too concerned about pressure on the patella, right? And so the natural instinct is to move the supports back and put some more space in. But if you move the knees too far back, what happens is as soon as you start going up, gravity is going to pull you into the machine, and you're going to end up standing like this. And then when you get to full standing, if you don't, if you don't bring your knees back far enough, you actually only get to this position. So you lose extension in your knees, you lose it in your hips, 
and you always have pressure on your knees. So what you want to do is you want to bring your knees back and that will in turn bring your hips back and that will drive all the force down onto your feet. So you actually won't have very much pressure on your knees. So what we want to do is we want to just make sure that we get this um, back. So what I'm going to do here is I see that I have plenty of space here. Now sometimes you have kids with, with chunky legs. In that case I might leave this a little bit looser. But I know that she's not going to have any trouble here. So I'm just going to take this tight. And it doesn't matter because even as we go up a few degrees, her whole body's going to come into it anyway. So she's going to bear some weight through the knees. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I get the patella into the middle of the knee pad. So what I don't want to do is have the patella right on the edge where I'm, sh where I'm pushing the patella up. So the way that these knee pads are designed is to take the whole knee right into the middle and surround it with the with the foam. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to raise these up a little bit. Now we have different size knee pads with the with the with the sit to stand standers. Um, so you don't always have to have the biggest one, but if you have a if you have a facility where you're fitting many kids into the same standard, usually you want the bigger one because you want to cover the most um, space possible. So what I've done is I've basically, I've got the patella in the middle. What I want to do is I want to make sure that these are at the same depth because, because I don't want them off a little bit because as soon as I put them off a little bit, it's going to twist my knees, my hips are going to twist. Now, if I have a child who's, who sits like this anyways, I might use that to my advantage and I might come back and I might put the knees a little bit the other way to force the body to bear weight through the other leg. But, but the first time, I'm when I'm putting the child in the first time, I'm going to do everything straight so that I can see them in standing, but then I might have in my mind that I'll make an adjustment the next time they go in. So I just want to make sure that this is straight here. Now once she's in the standing frame, the next step, and I so I, I'm going to adjust my seat depth. Now I did not adjust my seat depth because she actually fits this pretty well. But if I wanted to adjust the seat depth, Actually, the, the, the seat depth would be the first thing that we did that we would do before she got in there. So if you can see here that there's these colors here. So each one of these is two centimeters or one inch. And then you see that this is a there's a color here that's green and a color here that's green. So these always have to match. Now if I put this I'll just show you for a second. If I loosen this up, and you don't you don't want to actually do this when somebody's in here. So if you have a client in here, you don't really want to do this. But you see that if I go to yellow or orange, you see that I'm getting it's not a good position, right? So I've got orange here and yellow here. That means that this will not go when I go to standing. The back will always stay reclined. So when I get up to standing, they're going to lose all the support in the back. So I can't do that. So I just need to make sure that these colors are always matched up. So green with green. So if I was going to change it to one inch shorter, I would take this to yellow and then I would push this in and push that to yellow. So that's that's the seat depth adjustment. Okay, now, the um, when I'm setting the foot plate, just go ahead and let your foot hang. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, I'm going to find where the foot's supported and then a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take this and just put a little bit of um, dorsiflexion. Now why would I put dorsiflexion? The reason I do that is because as long as I'm standing, I do want to stretch that heel cord out. A lot of the kids have tight heel cords anyway. Now if I have a kid that has foot drop in the wheelchair and, there's, and, their, and their feet are hanging off their foot plates, then I might put it in a little bit of plantar flexion the first time just so that I don't stretch them too much because if I don't do that with some of those kids they're going to be standing like this in the standing frame anyway and it'll take them a few minutes to, to settle down into it. So you can make that assessment. Now once I've set this one, so I decided to set it this height, the next step is I just come over, I don't make the measurement on this side, what I do is I just match it so I make sure that they're even. So. It's not perfect, but it's close. Now what happens is sometimes when, when your clients are sitting in there after the transfer, their hips might be shifted a little bit. 
So if I was sitting in the if I was sitting in the standing frame, but my hips weren't straight, and this one was a little in front of this one, if my legs were hanging, I have to do it up here. Okay. Now my feet are straight here, right? But if if this leg goes a little bit in front because my hips are twisted, now you see that this foot is lower. Okay. So I don't want to set my foot plates according to the feet because what I want to do is get I want to get my knees straight and I want to put the support evenly under my foot. So I, f I found the depth with the first one and then I matched the foot plate with the second one because you want your you want your base stable. So now we've got her in a, in, a, in a good position where she can go up to standing. Then we can just put on the, um, the shadow tray. So and we'll just get it to the, the position there. Now once I have this in, what I, what I want to do is just lock in. Just get this to lock in on one side or the other. And that'll hold it in place. So let's see here. Go the other way. Nope. Go get this one to lock in. There, that one's locked in. Now you're not going to go anywhere. So now I've got her in a in a good position for for standing. So I've got the knees even, and I've got the feet even. And then we can go. Right up to standing. Now, if I did this right, what we'll see is that the back and the head support will stay in the same place. If I did this wrong, if I didn't do it right, what happens is the back support goes way up higher, and the head support goes way up high when I go to standing, and when I sit down, it comes way low. But because I did a relatively decent job, it's staying pretty close. Now, it's always going to move. This is called shear, so there's always going to be a little bit of shear because because, of course, this hip pivot point isn't exactly on our hip, and the knee isn't exactly on the hip, so there's always going to be a little bit. We don't have to be real precise. The, the equipment is quite forgiving. But you want to get it as close as possible, because if you do that, now look what we've done. We've, 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 we've provided a decent head support. Okay. So, what I, so when I take her up to standing, actually, most of the time I'm going to stop in two places. If, if this is the first time she's standing, usually I'm going to give her a, a chance right here, just to catch her breath, okay? To start breathing, because if I take her right up and she's not used to standing, she could get a little dizzy. But if I just give her 30 seconds, 45 seconds, maybe a minute in this position, she's going to be able to acclimate and handle it much better. Now, the next thing I want to do is try to go to full upright. Now, if I have a if I have a client that has a lot of tone or spasticity, usually I'm going to see it right about this point in time is where we're going to start to put some stretch on the hamstrings if they do have contractures. So usually what I do is when I get to about this point, I'm just going to come here and I'm going to see how, how the tendons are. Are they too tight? And I'm just going to try to feel how they are. If the, if the client can speak, I'm going to ask them, you know, does it hurt? <laughs> Sometimes they can't speak to you, so you'll look for, you know, if they're in pain or whatever. The next thing I want to do is just make sure that they're bearing weight. So sometimes they can be shifted or their muscles can be tight. And so I want to just check and see, is each foot bearing weight, right? Because sometimes what will happen is you'll get one foot that's completely loose. So they're bearing all the weight on one side. But we actually want even weight distribution. So then I have to go back and I have to look at my knee plaids. I have to look to see if they're hanging somewhere on the, on the belt. Because I, what I want is weight bearing all the way through the foot. Once I've, once I've checked that out, then I'm going to continue right to the full upright standing position. So now you tell me if it's too tight on your knees. So and if uh, so, we'll go right up. Now you feel like you're falling forward. Okay, so now we can see that she's pitching forward anyway. So what's going to happen? We're going to see this, right, after a little while. Now what I can do is I can also just change this a little bit. This is the back angle that I'm changing. And you'll feel that that makes a, a bit of a difference. Um, and actually, I have to say, you'll notice that this seat is about two inches thick. 
we actually changed its design and now it's the same thickness as this. So right now this is pushing her forward so we're actually not getting very good support in here at all. So if I wanted to give her some support I'd have to bring this in a little bit. But actually what I'm going to do is even that out. So if we have a client who doesn't have good head, head control, we make them stand in the upright position. We, we make them learn to balance their head a little bit. So we've gone sitting to standing. What I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to change this to supine. So if I take this and I just put it in supine, now rest your head on the, on the support. What I can do is I can just take it back and I can go a few degrees supine. Now she has a chance to rest her head. Now I want to go only to the point that I have to because the more that I go supine, even now I'm probably, I've probably taken 20% of the weight off. Just by going this few degrees, I've taken quite a bit of weight off. If I go even a little bit more, now I've taken 70% off. What I want to do is I want to maximize my weight bearing. So I only want to go until I see that the head is balanced. And actually what I want to do with the child is I want to go to the point where they start to they start to balance their head a little bit and move their head if they can. So so we go back and forth. Now you have to work and keep your head control. And we say, hey, you know, eyes up, look around, twist, look over here, look over there. You know, we're working on the on the head control. And then when they get tired, we just recline them back. And sometimes the kids can learn to just do this them, themselves as well. So what we've done is we've made the standing session effective not just for five minutes or 10 or 15 minutes, but now we've actually been able to extend it much longer because we're giving periods of rest, periods of activity, periods of rest, periods of activity. Now, after a while, she might get having your knees locked in and your hips locked in and not being able to change also gets uncomfortable after a while. So I can just take this also, I can take this back out of supine into sit to stand. But you see there what I did, and actually, I'll do that again. So right now I've got that in, in uh, I've got this in supine. Now she's bearing weight on the foot plate. So actually, if I was going to do that correctly, I'd bring the feet down, and once the feet are flat to the floor, then I can come back to sit to stand, and then I can come back down. And that's going then, then I'm not going to get that falling forward. But now I've now I've just put some now I, I've changed it again so now she can go um, to that position. Now I can also if I if I want to I can I can go actually from sit to stand to supine in this position as well. So if I go to if I go to the neutral position, I can actually pull this out a little bit, and I can do that. Now when I now I when I lock it in supine, it's locked, so now it's not going to move again. So and I can go up. But I can only go until my feet are flat to the floor. If I start to force it too much, you hear that I'm building up too much pressure on it. So I just need to stop when my feet are flat to the floor. Now, if I release this with pressure on it, it'll make a little sound and it lets it go. But I, so I don't really want to do that. I want to I want to make sure that my feet are down before I switch it back into a sit to stand position. So this is a this is this controller we actually have on all three sizes of the Bantam now. And it's a little easier to understand. The old Bantam, I don't know if anybody had experience with the old one, but you had you used to have to flip a latch underneath and there were some handles on the side that you had to turn. Now it's much easier just to, you just, you're either in sit to stand or the, or the supine um, position. I'm going to, I'm going to let you come down and out of it. Now the other thing, that we can do is we can also use this. So let's say if I wanted to, if I wanted, to, I could also, um, if I put this back into supine here, now what if I go back, it's also going to give you more of a reclined position like that. So of course that's comfortable for a little while. You know, it's a, it's, it's a resting position. Um, then if I want to switch out of it, though, I have to go back, put the feet to the floor, and then come back in to sit to stand, and then I come down again. So.
Now, one other thing I wanted to show you, I'll do this without her in here, but let's imagine for a second that we had a child with, with quite a different, quite a difficult, um, quite a difficult posture. If I put this in neutral, I can actually lay this all the way down to full flat um, position. So sometimes it might be easier to do a transfer in this position. But what I find a lot with the kids, a lot of times a position like this is very nice for transferring. So I'll, I'll go to a, I'll go to an angle like this. I'll lock it into supine. Now I can bring the child out maybe with a lift. So we're talking about children that have severe hip contractures or that when you start to move them, they just go into extension and, and they, they're, they're not easy to move around. Well, a, what, transferring into a position like this instead of the sitting position is easier because I'm using gravity to help control the trunk. I'm using gravity to help control the, the, um, the body as we transform in. So here again, I just flip these knee pads out of the way or I can even pull it all the way off if I want to like that. Now I can put the, now I can put the, the client in and I can adjust the supports. Now let's imagine we have a kid who has one leg over here and the other leg over here and they just, they're not going to easily go into a standing frame. What I can do is I can put them in and now I can start, once I get them in, I can start to match the frame to the body. So I can open this up a little bit because the leg is going to come out this way. I can rotate this pad a little bit so that it matches the contour of the body. I can put it up or down. I can play with the angle of the foot plate so I can rotate that out. I can, I can put some abduction into the foot plate. This will all slide around a little bit. Um, maybe I need to back the knee pad off a little bit like this. Now this is, this is going to be a more, this is going to be a situation where we're going to have to take our time, but I'll just give you a, a look at this from straight on. So now we've got, and this will probably be up just a little higher if we do that. Okay. So now I've got a kid whose, whose legs aren't going to go straight, right? They might have a hip flexion contracture. They might have a knee contracture. But I can take them right from this position, and I can just start to slowly bear weight and see how they tolerate it. And I might just go a little bit. Now I might just check the knees, see if I have too much pressure on the inside of the knee, on the outside of the knee, how the hips are. But all of a sudden I'm giving a kid a chance to stand who probably really has no other way. They just don't have a good way to stand otherwise. And I can take it really gradually where I'm not putting a lot of force on them right away, but we're just going a few degrees at a time. So you'll see, so imagine a kid who's got, you know, a pretty severe hip contracture where they, where this is all they can do. But maybe on the other side there, they have a little more flexibility. So what I can do is I can take that leg, I can put it out, I can bring it back. And, and, but this one's going to be a little bit lower, but I can actually find that position a little bit and put them into standing position. Now they might not get to full nicely upright position, but I can actually load a little bit of weight through the hips. I can start to stretch the hamstrings. So as a therapist, you can be creative with the equipment and you can think about how do I want to isolate that muscle, bear some weight on the hamstring, or how do I want to bear some weight through the heel cord? Um, and you can, and you can, I mean, uh, uh, with this sit to stand and combined with supine, you can really start to you can really start to do some therapy on kids that's otherwise just really tough to even imagine uh, trying to do that with so so that's just a little bit about the um the fitting on that one on the bantam medium um we only have about <laughs> 20 minutes left any questions about this what i'm going to do is just go to the zing now, and I think I kind of talked about all this. I think with the zing, maybe I'm just going to show you instead of going through the slides because we don't have too much time. And then I'll show you one or two videos. 
Okay, so with this one, we're talking about sit to stand. Now the Zing, um, we've got this in a size one. Now this is going to go down to a nine month old, but this is a little bit different because we're talking about supine stander, vertical stander, and a prone stander, um, but it's not sit to stand. So what we do with this one, the, tr the position that we transfer in is in the horizontal position. Now, when we designed this, we, we had to decide if we wanted the height of this up where it's easy for mom or dad or the caregiver to manage it, or if we wanted it at peer height where the kids can be eye to eye, face to face with their peers. We decided that it was more important to have it easier for the therapists and the parents because peer height's important, but it's more important that they get in and out every day. Um, so we brought this up so that it's at a good working height for mom or dad to get in. So basically you're going to bring the child in, you're going to lay them down. Now the way that you fit this is you start right at the hips, okay? And then everything else adjusts out. So what I want to do is I want to take the top of the shoulders and I want to have the top of the shoulders even with this pad. So I can, if, if I'm dealing with a really small child, I go small or I just open it up. Now you're going to want to do this before they get in. So you need to take, a, you need to just measure um, or have an idea of where it needs to be at before they get in. So I can adjust this up or down as well. So this is going to be where the hips are. Now the knee supports um, come into place and these can be adjusted down. So normally that must have been fit to go in the van, but these will come all the way off so I can just drop them right on. What I want to do is I want to also get the height of this appropriate as well. Now this also gives me a chance to manage contractures. So if I have a knee that can't go to full extension, I'm going to get this support up a little bit and I'm going to know what my what my measurement is. So this is how I manage the back of the calf. But we'll just assume in this case that we can go flat. So I'll just set that flat. Um, I'm going to loosen this up a little bit. There we go. We'll get everything nice and straight here. And we'll put that in there. And then of course we can adjust the height of the um, the foot plates as well. So I'm going to set this up and you want to, I can do plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, I can move this in and out as well. So once we get all this set up, now here again, I'm going to just show you some, I can also play, I can also manage the leg at different positions. So let's assume that the knees are relatively So I've set this up a little bit different for on each side, but that's okay. All right, so the, the tray, so I've, I've got the child in, I, I adjust him in. I can put the, I can put the straps on as well while they're laying down, but this swing away tray basically flips over from, from either side. Now I can have this right in position as they go up or I can bring them up to, to I can leave it off until they come up a little bit. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from supine uh, into, and it's easier if I lock the, I'll lock the casters here. So supine, and I go right into the upright position. Now there's a little um, latch on the side here. So it says supine to stand. So when I get to vertical upright, it's going to stop me right at the upright position. Um, so I go to full weight bearing. Now, if I want to continue into prone position, I just flip this latch over and it says prone on it. Now, before I go to prone, however, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little bit of adjustment to this tray. So if I'm going to go 10 degrees prone, I'm going to go 10 degrees. If I'm going to go, the maximum it'll do is uh, um, 30 degrees. So if I want to go to the maximum, I'm going to put a little bit more height in here. Now this I can also adjust up or down. Now if I am going to do prone standing, then I want to use the vest. If I'm not going to do prone standing, it's not so crucial to use a vest because I have support through the pad. 
But if I do want to do pronite, I want the complete support of the, of the chest pad on. Um, so anyway, now I flipped, I flipped the latch to prone, and now I can go right in and do prone standing, and the, and the tray is flat. And so the, the child can stand prone for a while. kid comes and happens to step on this, it won't move, it'll just be locked in position. Um, this one doesn't have it on it, so if they were actually standing and somebody stepped on it, it would just come down again. That's not a critical thing, but we, we have that on the, we also have that on the, on the Bantam Smalls as well. So, um, so that's the Zing. I do want to show you, if you look in, we have a couple different styles of the Zing. Um, so this one here is called Zing TT, tilt table. It's exactly the same frame. It's exactly the same function with abduction, with everything else. But you'll notice that the surface area of the pad is much bigger, okay? So now there's some advantages. When you have a, when you have a support, when you have the MPS 
th like this one, we're actually we're actually precisely putting the support on each joint where we want to have it. So, so I'm controlling the pelvis, I'm controlling the trunk, I'm controlling the knee, each joint specifically, and so it works okay. But something like this also can be it's a little more general. So basically, you put the kid in and you strap them down with the straps. It's faster. So if you have an environment where you have five or six kids in the same standing frame, maybe something like that is easier. It's not going to be as precise, but it's going to be much quicker. Put one kid in, strap them down, stand them up, take them down. And if you're standing these kids every day, you can, you can do that. Sometimes the kids that haven't stood for a while need something with more precise position. But you do have the choice of having something like this. So I could, and you can also change. You can get bigger sizes. There's three different sizes of pads here. There's three different sizes of pads there, so you can make the, the size bigger, smaller. You also have a little bit more of a general head support here, so it's just kind of a different style. That's just called thing or TT, but it's exactly the same kind of thing that I, that I just showed you on this one as well. And then, so here you just see a little boy standing supine, standing prone in the in the TT function. You can get these different colorful pads on here as well. They're, they're covers. So this is a standard pad. <coughs> the nice thing about these is they just come off and go in the wash. So especially on the seat one, if it gets wet, you just take it off, put it in the wash, and put the other one on. Um, now we also have a thing that is specifically for prone position. So you'll see here, that this is a very basic one, it's just a, a, a flat foot plate, knee pad, and prone supports. Basically what we've done is instead of the child facing this way, we turn it around and we face this way and we just change the pads a little bit. So when we actually put them in, they actually go in face down. And then they go back to standing this way. Or you can put them in standing up if they're going. But what it does is it just puts more interior support on the surface of the body and turns them around. So this one will go prone to upright. If you, if you really want to concentrate on prone, it might be a little bit better. This one doesn't have the interior support. It goes prone, but it relies on the chest strap to do the prone stand. So that one's just a little, that one's more specific towards prone. And then and here you see a little girl in that prone stand. And then the last one is just the vertical. So this one doesn't change positions at all, you just come standing up. And sometimes, um, this really just depends on the system that you're in. So we have some countries, some systems that this is a, a little cheaper product, it's not so sophisticated, but a lot of times, sometimes it just kids go and standing up, and when they're, when they're little, two years old, five years old, it works just fine. It doesn't really work when the kids get older. So this is Zing size one. And actually, in about two months, or in a few weeks actually, but by the time we get to Hong Kong, we're going to have some size too. So we'll have all the functions, but it'll be up to about the size of the band we need, with the supine upright plum and stand and stuff as well. So we can do abduction as well. So um, we just have 10 minutes till 9 o'clock. I have a few videos and case studies that I can get to, but I think instead maybe um, if you have any questions, I can take some questions. Um, yeah, I'll play the videos. If you can, if you can, um, I'll give you a, um, I'll have a choice. So we have, we have a few videos here. Each one is about five minutes long. Um, so the first one is a bantam with little girls moving a mobile bantam around. Uh, it's girls with, um, it's, I think it's a kind of dystrophy that they have. I have another one of a little girl with a, with a bantam in a school system. And the video talks to the physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, teacher, educator, um, school principal, and they all talk about how changing positions helps that child learn better, but also accomplishes all the therapy goals. And then, I, and then 
the other one's just a kind of a promotional digit. So, you want the second one? Okay. No, that's not it. Okay, this is it. Now, I'll try to put the microphone in. to the cell. 
quicker.